Amen. Amen. I know what you're wondering. Uh, who is this pastor looking fella and what has he done with Elliot? I know what you're thinking, but don't, don't worry about it. I am Elliot. This is Elliot. This is the real Elliot. And my wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Give it up for yourselves because, hey, you're the body of Christ. That's the, that's the hope of the world right there. We just love it so much. We have a mission here at the church. You can say it with me if you know it. It's to be a lifeline by leading people and becoming lifelong followers of Jesus. That's right. He's the man. He's the one we look up to. He's the one we're pushing towards every single day, every single one of us taking one step closer to Jesus. Just a quick reminder. I know Tiffany and Pastor Tiffany and um, Mark, Pastor Mark already shared with you a little bit, but Growth Track Step 1 is today, and I got a promise for you, okay? This is a special little promise for you. Tiffany and I are going to do the Growth Track, but it's going to be the quickest growth track after church you've ever, ever seen in your life. So maybe this is the one for you because you're like, man, I'd love to do growth track and serve on the dream team and all that. But like, I think it's going to be long. Check it out. I've got a Super Bowl party to get to and I've got to play nine holes before that. And so this class is going to go quick. Let's go. You're like, hey, all right, I'll, I'll get in there for that. Growth Track is today, step one. It's not just a Bible study. It's the on-ramp into everything we do in the church, and so I wanted to just let you know about that. The notes, you should have the notes in the bulletins like they already shared with you, but there's also the YouVersion Bible app that you can download. If you like you know, reading the Bible, taking notes on your phone, just download the YouVersion Bible app. And you can follow along with all the notes. Our team puts that together and does a really good job so that you can automatically highlight the stuff and, and plug in the fill in the blanks and have fun with it like that. So we're in part two of this series called Who Am I? One of the most important questions that we ask ourselves since, the, like, since we become conscious of ourselves. It's like, who am I? Who am I supposed to be? What, what's going on? And then all the way to the day of our death, we're thinking, but what, what, did I do what I was supposed to do? It's a lifelong question that we continually ask, and outside of Jesus, we'll never have a good answer for that question of who am I? This series is all about finding our identity in Jesus, especially when the hard things come, because that's when our identity is challenged the most, is when the hard seasons come, or in certain situations. Last week, we talked about who am I when I don't measure up, right? You guys remember that? You talked about it in your life groups, maybe. Uh, who's, who's involved in the life groups around here? Raise your hand if you're going to a life group around here. That's, dang, we had 124 people sign up for life groups. Come on, I think that's a huge win. We're celebrating. <laughs> Wonderful. A lot of great leaders out there leading people closer to Jesus through the context of these groups. I mean, it's fun to come to church and to... Hear a, hear a message and be inspired and be encouraged. That's all great, but really life change and discipleship happens in the context of these smaller life groups that we do. It's not too late. I, I know I'm a little bit repeating what they said already, but don't, don't miss these groups. If you're not yet signed up for a group, it's going to bless you so much to sign up for. And there's even a midweek opportunity to take your kids, drop them off. I said, drop your kids off. And like some parents in here are not hearing me. You drop them off. And then you get to go to whatever group. We got a men's group, a women's group, a co it's like all on Wednesday night. Hello, come on. Like how, how much better can we make it for you? So check it out if you haven't signed up for one yet. Um, and we're all doing this concept, Who Am I? For during this series, which is a six week series, we're in part two of it. All the groups are going to be doing the same thing. So you've got some stuff that you'll talk about in your group, but you'll also be able to process the message together, which I think is a beautiful way to like grow in community. Amen, everybody? It's a good thing. Last week was who am I when I don't measure up, and this week is like the ugly step cousin to that, not measuring up. It's, it's who am I when I compare myself to others, when I compare myself to others. Um, it's, it's, really, um, it's really quite a scary thing. It's like part two of last week's message. So me, for me personally, let me just start things off by being um, a little vulnerable with you guys again. I know last week I had to be vulnerable. This series is going to be rough for me. I'm going to have to tell you the truth about myself in a way that I don't really want to all the time. But let me just like paint the picture. I, I struggle with comparison from a very early age. Uh, and what comes to my mind is sports. Sports come to my mind because uh, when I was growing up, I, I compared myself to the other athletes in my class and I didn't quite measure up to them But because uh, I was comparing myself to them. I only played two sports. I played uh, soccer and I played baseball. 
football, just look at me, all right? It wasn't in the cards, all right? It just didn't work out. It wasn't for me. I was going to get you know, pummeled and pulverized in that. So soccer, low impact. Baseball, low impact. We actually coached t-ball last year. That was an experience. Oh my gosh, let me tell you something. Our uh, you know, six-year-old boy was uh, in there, and uh, there's a great difference between six-year-olds, between men and women, and uh, little, little boys and little girls, and they, just, they develop at different speeds. You understand what I'm trying to say? Like, so there's a bunch of you know, six-year-olds and maybe some seven-year-olds out there, and some are up here and some are down here. You know what I'm trying to say? Like We had some, we had some cr- wild, wild times trying to lead that group. A lot like here. It's a lot like here, really. It was like herding cats out there. A lot like here. A lot like here. We had some people hitting bombs out there, and then some people were out there picking daisies. A lot like here. A lot like here. Um, no, there was, there was really a, a young girl who was uh, right around the same age of, as Evan, and she was hitting it over everybody's head. It was just absolutely crazy, just wild differences. So me, I was the late bloomer, right? I'm in, and I was comparing myself to all the other uh, athletes in, the, in my age range, and they just stuck me at two positions, both they're very similar in soccer and baseball. Can you guess what they are? Uh, in baseball, I was the catcher, and in soccer, I was the goalie. goalie. That's right. You know what, Elliot? You just sit there and try Don't let balls get by you. Just block stuff. Don't let it buy you, and you'll be okay. That's what you did. So, like, I was kind of just trying to do my best, trying to hang in there, and uh, it was actually, like, my first little leadership challenge because it's the one position in both sports where you're, you're surveying the whole landscape and trying to make big moves based on everybody, whatever. But I was a little kid. I wasn't doing that. I was just sitting there in a bunch of equipment. <laughs> so here's where the vulnerability comes in. Let me tell you about soccer for, for Elliot. Elliot for soccer was a really sad story. Um, See, I struggled so much with insecurity. I struggled so much with comparing myself because all my friends, they could dribble, they could shoot, they could do all the stuff, man. But I, I felt so insecure that I was literally standing in the goal box crying like the whole game. I'm crying. Some of you have kids like this. They're, they're like crying out there because they're feeling the pressure. Or maybe you didn't because I think I was the only one out there. I was just crying. And I was so afraid that I was going to let a goal happen and I was going to let the whole team down. So you put me in a place where I wasn't going to be needed much, but here I am. I got the most pressurized spot ever. And there was a position among the parents on my team. That's right. They had to stand next to the goal box and comfort poor little Elliot. <laughs> The whole season. And do you think it ended in under sixes? Nah. Nah. It kept going for under eights, under tens. I was a mess out there. It was really sad. It was really sad. I, like, I, just, I, struggled, with, I struggled with my security. I struggled because I compared myself to others. I felt so inferior because I knew I couldn't do what the big hitters were doing. I couldn't do what the, what the strikers and the goal makers were doing. I compared myself to them, so I felt inferior to them. And it robbed me of any joy that I could have had playing sports growing up. Sports wasn't my main thing when I was in high school, if some of you know what I'm talking about. I'll tell you my story later. All right. But do you remember being compared to others? Do you remember being young, being compared to others, being like measured up like that? You're compared to others maybe. Maybe it wasn't, maybe it wasn't when you were young. Maybe it's more recent. Maybe, maybe you're compared to others very, very recently, like your performance at work the other managers at work, the other people at work, and you're compared to them on a pretty regular basis, and so you're feeling inferior or maybe a little bit arrogant, but in one way or another, you're compared to them. How about with friends? Do you ever feel compared when it comes to your friend group, and maybe they start inviting, they stop inviting you to the things they're doing, or maybe they start inviting someone else in your place? You ever feel like you've been compared among your friends? I know that would never happen here. That's a good thing. Good job. In your life group, everyone's invited. How about with your siblings? How about in your family? You ever been compared to a sibling? No, oh, I know most of us have, haven't we? we? We get compared to our siblings. Maybe that's happening right now. Maybe as an adult, it still happens. Maybe because of how much money you make or don't make. Maybe because your place in life, whether you have kids or don't have kids, you're being compared to others. And listen, there's, there's two forms of comparison I'm going to talk about today. The first one is, is being compared to someone else, and the second is comparing yourself to someone else. And that's the most dangerous one. When we, comp- when we internalize it and we start comparing ourselves to others, 
That's a very, very dangerous place to be. Comparison, whether internal or external, is a trap from the enemy, and God has a way to set us free through his word. Let me tell you about what we're going to be today is in 1 Samuel chapter 18. If you've got your paper Bible, would you hold it up? There's got to be at least one, right? Hallelujah! I knew I had at least one right there. Come on. Somebody held up their screen. Oh, there's a whole bunch of you. Yeah, that's right. That's what I'm talking about. Somebody give them a Bible buck. Is any greeters got the Bible bucks out there? I'm sorry. That's a churchy joke. I wasn't even raised in church. I know about Bible bucks. It's crazy. First Samuel, the very end of chapter 17 and most of chapter 18. I'm going to bounce around a lot, but this is a story about Saul. Saul, the first king of Israel, he was the golden boy of Israel, okay? He was chosen to be the first king. And by the way, Israel wanted a king because they compared themselves to other nations. That was the whole reason they wanted a king. And God's like, no, don't do it. You're going to regret this. But, but the nation was like, no, we want him, we want him. And he's like, all right, all right. I'll pick the tallest, most handsome, most qualified looking one of the whole bunch, and we'll get Saul in there. But this is a story all about how Saul's life got flipped, turned upside down. I've been working on a way to incorporate that. That's what I do for the sound check every week. So anyway, that's for you, production. <laughs> that's for you. But in this story, it's not just about Saul, because when his life gets turned upside down, it's because this guy, David, shows up. King David. A lot of people know him as King David, the psalmist, the shepherd. He was the second king of Israel, but that's getting ahead of myself. This is a story about comparison and comparison's poisonous ability to destroy our lives. We're going to watch it happen to Saul. We're going to paint that picture. This destroys Saul's life. So in, in, let me just paint the picture, a little backstory here. In, in 1 Samuel 18, it's like a scene out of Braveheart. Have you seen Braveheart? If you haven't seen Braveheart, you're a child, okay? Just, I'm, just like, read a book, you know? Go, go watch Braveheart. Two VHSs is what it took to watch Braveheart when I was growing up, all right? Get at my level. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm feeling silly. Too much coffee, I guess. Uh, there's the Philistine army on one side, and there is the Israelite army on one side. They're both standing on top of these, like, hills, and then there's a valley in between, but the Philistines have a competitive advantage. They have a guy named Goliath. Goliath is nine feet tall or something, and he's like, ha, 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 ha. Anybody who wants to fight me, come down and fight me. That's the sound that my wife makes whenever she's reading the story to my kids. Ha, ha, ha. I picture, so now anytime someone says Goliath, he's like some silly cartoon I don't know. I'm getting mixed up here. They got, they got Goliath, okay? Goliath is there, and Saul, the king, is like stuck. He doesn't know what to do because Goliath is down there saying, anybody who can come and beat me, we will all bow down to you, and this battle will be over if anybody can come in and beat me. Anybody want to fight a nine-foot guy? I don't even want to fight guys shorter than me, okay? I don't want to do it. It's not my... It's not my strength, okay? It's not my thing, but that's where they were at. So David comes along. And he beats the giant, like long story short, right? You thought I was going to preach about David and Goliath. His story isn't about that. David comes along. He's like, I got this little sling, little rock. Wapow! Giant dead. All done. All good. He comes along. He's the, he's the, he becomes the hero. It's the classic underdog story. Because like many of us, David was overlooked. He was overlooked and undervalued pretty much his whole life. Life. When Samuel, the prophet who wrote this, is named after him, 1 Samuel, when Samuel comes to David's house, which is Jesse's house, and says, hey, the next king after Saul is going to be one of your sons, send all your sons out. Jesse's like, all right, I'll send all my sons out, except David. He's so dumb. David's so dumb. He's so short. The Bible says he's short. And so the first king is tall. David's short. I'm not even going to send him out. Some of you feel that way. Not short. Overlooked undervalued. It's like, hello, I'm right here. Can you imagine what that must have felt like for David? He was a child when this happened. He was young when this happened, but he was overlooked and undervalued his whole life. And this is a story about how the Bible teaches us that God uses overlooked and undervalued people to accomplish his purpose over and over and over again. So if you have been overlooked and if you have been undervalued, it's a good place to say amen because God can use you and he wants to. I think he even gets more glory and more credit when he uses some of us 
like me, like us out here that are like, hey, we're just normal, just regular people. I'm only 5'11", you know, or I'm only 5'8". I'm not like the most whatever, you know, I have to really do whatever to get noticed. But God's like, no, I can use that person. Let's read this scripture here. 1 Samuel, starting in chapter 17, starting in verse 57, 58, goes like this. As soon as David returned from killing Goliath, so Goliath is dead, um, he killed him. Abner brought him to Saul, which was, and he brought the Philistine's head in his hand. He's like, what's up, bro? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you want to talk about? You want to talk about, I'm holding this giant's head, but you know, you could talk to me. No, we're good. What do you want to say? Like, I just, I wish I had a fake, this is a, this is in the Bible. I love the Bible. It's so graphic. It's a kid's book, you know? You want to read just these verses to your kids. David chops, like, saws off the giant's head. Any kids in here? This is awesome, right? A serrated knife is like, gah, 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 gah. by the hair, might have had dreadlocks, right? <laughs> holds it up, just to make the imagery a little bit better. He holds it up. He's like, yeah, what do you want to talk about? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, who's short now, bro? What's up? Let's do this. He, David is bad. I like him a lot. I like him a lot. And he goes on to say this, tell me about your father. This is Saul speaking to David. Tell me about your father, young man. And David replied, his name is Jesse, that fool who overlooks me, my dad. I love him. But from that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. What I want to tell you is at first, Saul liked David, obviously. Like, this is great. They won Saul and David, they're like this, man. David was in, this is not the first time they met, by the way. David was in there playing his little harpsichord, whatever. And Saul is feeling good, if you're familiar with the Bible, that David was in his court and his presence already. They knew each other already at this point. But he's saying, now I'm going to keep you, David. Now you're not returning to your father's home. Now you're going to stay with me. Now you're going to stay with me. Things are going good at this point. And they live happily ever after. Let me pray for you. No, this is not how the story ends. No, before long... Before long, Saul is throwing spears at David, trying to pin him against the wall, the Bible says. Again, love this book. Love the Bible. It is so graphic, so, so real. He's trying to pin him with spears, like bipolar much? I thought you just liked this guy. Now you're trying to kill him? And he plots his murder, trying to trap him, and eventually is chasing David around with his entire army for like seven, eight years. You know, war is expensive, like he invested everything, all of his kingdom, to chase it. What happened? What the heck happened to make this happen? Look, look, I'll show you exactly what happened, and you might be surprised. Maybe you've read this before, you never noticed, like where it happened, where it took place. First Samuel 18, 6 through 9. When the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David killed the Philistine, so here we are in that story, they're coming home. Women from all over the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. Pay attention. This was their song. Saul has killed his thousands, but David, his ten thousands. Now, I've got good news for you. Let's keep we're just right here, right here. I, I've been studying really hard, and I've been looking at the ancient manuscripts, and I've been looking at like historical databases, and they actually found this song, the melody of it. They found how it was sung, and in fact, they turned it into a Spotify song. You can look at for it on Spotify. Do you ever know this? Yeah. I'm sorry. DJ, I want, I want you to hear this. You want to hear it? Yeah. You want to hear this song? Yeah. Let's play this song. Let me play this song for you. Here come the women out of the Israelite towns. They're coming out of their huts. They got the tambourines and the cymbals. Oh, here comes David and Saul. And they're about to sing. Saul has killed his thousands. David his ten thousands. Saul has killed his thousands. David his ten thousands. Saul is a chump. Yeah, yeah. David's so cool. Yeah, yeah. Saul is a chump. Yeah, yeah. David's so cool. Yeah. Then they start dancing. No, you got to stop that. I'm going to keep on going. Oh, my God. (gasps) I'm sorry. I think that's where Michael Jackson got it from, was from this biblical narrative. If you didn't know, Michael Jackson was saved, filled with spirit to... You'll never hear that song the same way again. You're welcome. You're welcome. 
Solace killed I've been singing this all week. Solace killed his thousands. David his ten thousands. I'm not much of a dancer, but... <laughs> okay, I got this. Keep going, keep going. Um, this made Saul very angry, the scripture says. <laughs> this made Saul very angry. And, and that's how you know he's a psychopath. Who could be angry when they hear a song like that? Who could be angry? No, 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 no. Just to get serious again. I mean, they were singing. They came out. Here's the king of Israel, right? And here's my new pet giant slayer with me. And all, all the women, all right, because it had to be women, right, come out, and Saul is a normal human male, and the women all come out, and they're like, oh, yeah, we got a song for you. And they're like, yeah, you're, you're all right, Saul, but David, he's great. <laughs> and watch this. Watch what the scripture says. You'll see it now. Yeah, and you'll never unsee this. You'll never unsee it. What's this, he said? They credit David with ten thousands and me with only thousands. Next, they'll be making him their king. So from that time on, from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Let me, let me explain what happened. This is a key point. This could be the key point in this whole story and what drove Saul mad because he was driven mad, absolutely mad hatter, crazy, bonkers. You could read the story. It's not that long. You could read it and it's like coming up right after that, a couple chapters. Wouldn't take you that long to read it. I encourage you to do so. He goes crazy. His focus turned from himself, maintaining his own integrity, being, becoming better, growing. His focus turned from himself over to someone else. And now he was focused with, he was externally, by these women, he was externally compared to others. And what did he do? He internalized it. And he turned that comparison internal. And that eventually drove him Bonkers. What destroyed Saul's love for David? Comparison. What destroyed his ability to be king and function? Comparison. They gave him credit for killing thousands, but he couldn't enjoy that. How could he? When someone right next to him is killing ten thousands. He, he was king of the victorious nation, but he couldn't enjoy that because he wasn't the star. You understand what I'm saying? Like something switched inside of him, so the comparison took over, and he couldn't take joy in his life anymore. He couldn't. He couldn't take joy in his own victories because his eyes and his focus were on David. All he cared about was beating him. And let me tell you something. Write this down in your notes. Materialize, put it on your bathroom mirror. Tattoo it on your arm. No, don't do that. But like, listen to this. Listen to this. Comparison is a game you can't win. You will never, ever in your entire life, ever be able to win the comparison game. If you engage, you will lose. Well, I know you, what you might be thinking, especially some guys in here. I'm a guy. I'm just like any of you. I know what I'm thinking. I'm looking over going, well, I know I'm better than that fool right there. I mean, like, there's at least, I can win at least once. You know, I'm like, there's that guy right there. I'm better than him. I'm not picking on you. <laughs> look, at, I had to look at somebody. I know I'm better than him. You know, or maybe, maybe you're a lady and you're like, well, I know. Look, look at her hair. You know, my hair is better than her hair. You know, so I'm, I know I'm better than her. What I'm trying to tell you is keep looking. Yeah. If you play that game, if that's the route you want to go, all I'm saying is keep looking. You will eventually and inevitably find someone that is better than you. That's why if you play that comparison game, you will eventually and inevitably lose. And what do you do? What do you do when you're playing a game that you cannot win? You quit. <laughs> that's what you do. You quit. Come on, do I got any competitive people in here, man? If I can't win, I'm out of here. Man, game over. I'm out. Man, is there anybody competitive up in here, man? It's like, it's like that's, that's what we would do. We just quit playing. We don't quit comparing. We quit trying. We quit living our lives pursuing God and having any joy in what he's doing in our life. And we quit growing and start dying spiritually when we play the comparison game, because it's a game you can't win. It's a lot like the Super Bowl tonight. It's a lot like the Super Bowl tonight because, you know, nobody cares. It's a game nobody cares about. I have gotten not, there's not one party that I know of happening because nobody gives a rip in our area, right? It's so dumb. Why? Because God's chosen team, the 49ers, aren't there. That's false teaching, someone said. 
That's not sound doctrine. I mean the Raiders. The Raiders, God's chosen team. The Raiders are not there. And, and football's newest chosen Messiah, Brock Purdy, is not going to be there. So it's like, if my team's not there, what do I care? I don't care about this thing. I will show up for two reasons. Commercials and food. That's it. That's all I care about. <laughs> your team, if your team's not there, if your team can't win, and, and if your team is there, it's amazing. If your team is there, you prepare all week to watch this game. All week long, you're ready for this, and distractions will not be tolerated. And when your team is not there, the food commercials, all you're there for. But let me tell you, a lifestyle of comparison is like watching a football game that you don't care about. It passes the time, but it's, it's pointless. Your life becomes pointless because it's, it's you can't win when you, when you engage with comparison. And Saul, the, the story of Saul shows us that when we live this way, and I'm, I think you'd be surprised at how often we do this. We do it to ourselves. It's, we do it so often, we don't even realize it. We don't realize we're comparing ourselves to others all the time. Comparison's a game you can't win. You ultimately suck all the joy out of your life. And compa- comparison puts two things into your soul that destroy you and destroy your relationships. Number one is this. Write this in your notes. It, it causes jealousy towards them. The people that you're comparing yourself to, it causes jealousy. And the definition of jealousy, you might be surprised to realize, is a, a state of fear. Did you know jealousy? In, in the dictionary, if you read it and put some, I put some definitions together to kind of make a working definition for us, a state of fear or suspicious guarding, a suspicious guarding, suspicious guarding that causes you to envy what another has or what another has done. It's like you get this dog bowl mentality. My dog bowl. Like you keep, it isolates us. Jealousy isolates us because we're afraid it makes us afraid. Jealousy is fear that someone's going to take my stuff, that someone has better than me. It makes us territorial. It isolates us. That's why I'm so encouraged with so many people going to life groups. Like almost every hand was raised in here going into life groups because we're getting over our territorialism. And there's going to be people in that group that have things that you want, but you're getting over that to say, it's not about me versus them. It's about me and you getting closer to Jesus. That's a beautiful thing to see in any church ever. All right, it's beautiful. I love seeing it because jealousy isolates us and jealousy is rooted in fear. It's rooted in fear. Remember uh, Saul's jealous eye? That's what we talked about. He turned a jealous eye towards David. Well, it turned into fear. Watch this in 1 Samuel 18. 1 Samuel 18, Saul was then afraid of David for the Lord was with David and had turned away from him. Finally, Saul sent him away. When you're jealous, you don't even want to see that fool in your newsfeed. You know what I'm saying? You don't want to see her in your news feed because you're like, I don't even want to see that because it reminds me what I don't like about them or what I want that they have. We don't even want to see them. We've all been there before, I think. David continued to succeed in everything he did for the Lord was with him. When Saul recognized this, he became even more afraid of him. What do you feel like? I have a question for you. What do you feel like when you see or hear about someone else's win? And I know what you're thinking. You're a bunch of good Christian people. Oh, I'm happy for them. I'm so happy for Jesus. Uh, I'm just so, I celebrate with them, alongside of them, rejoicing in praise. Shut up. Not always. Not always. When someone else is saying, yeah, I got that promotion. You're like, yeah, cool. <laughs> good, cool. So happy for you. Yeah, we, we just got engaged. <laughs> So happy for you. The churchy answer is, I'm always happy for people when they're doing good. But let's, be, let's just, nobody has to raise their hand. Sometimes, don't we feel like a little inferior? Like, like a little afraid that I'm not where I should be compared to you? This is scary because this is so sneaky. It creeps into our lives and it causes all sorts of problems because it causes us to self-medicate, causes us to, it drives us into sin, actually, because we, we're trying to cope with our feelings of insecurity. I should be a, it's in the church, you know? I've been saved as long as this person. How come they're doing so good? They're leading the Bible study. I'm not. I'm so, I'm so happy for you. <laughs> no, thinking, that should be me. That should be me. How come I'm not? Oh, good, congratulations. 
Serious. This is serious stuff. How do you feel when there's a reflection? Nobody has to raise their hand. Nobody has to answer out loud. How do you feel when you see vacation pics on social media, but you know you can't even afford to take your family on a vacation? It hurts. Does it, does it make you afraid of your own shortcomings compared to others, that is? Again, how do you feel when you see the other kids, you know, are getting straight A's, but your kid is struggling in school? Does it make you afraid that you're not measuring up as a parent? Or maybe your kid's struggling with something else, but the other kids, oh, they're valedictorian. So compared to them, I'm not a, I'm, I must not be a very good parent then. How do you feel when... You're seeing wedding pictures online, but you are not engaged yet. Does it make you feel like you're afraid that somehow you're undesirable just compared to others? This is serious stuff, serious. How do you feel when you hear about their promotion when you're the one who wanted it? You're the one who was going for it, and you got passed over, overlooked for them to get it. Do you have this fear, the sinking fear that you're not smart enough, not good enough? When we compare ourselves to others, It causes jealousy and fear of failure, which leads to this. Number two, write this down. It leads to hatred. If you eventually, if you play that tape out, it will lead to hatred for people. Instead of love like we're supposed to have, comparing yourself to others will lead to a a semi-fear and jealousy of them, which will cause you to hate them. It'll cause you to hate them. You don't even want to see them. You'd never say it this way. You're all good church folk. You'd never say this. But it looks like this. Wishing for their downfall. You know, when that really pretty girl at school, she's wearing her heels, and then they snap, and you're like, I know, you've never, ever done that. You know the, you know the scratch golfer who got the new clubs, and he, he's standing up there, and he shanks one into the water, and you're like, I'm sorry about that, bro. That's, that's really too bad. And then you just feel a little bit more relaxed because compared to them, it makes you feel better about yourself when they don't do well. That's, that's, a, lot, that's a lot like hatred. I'm serious. That's a lot like hating your neighbor instead of loving them, wanting their victory. Has this gotten serious yet? This is serious stuff because this is where we all live from time to time. And this is the last part of the story we're going to look at. Watch this in 1 Samuel 18, 20. In the meantime, Saul's daughter, Michael, I promise you it's a girl that he was getting married to, had fallen in love with David, and Saul was delighted when he heard about this because why? Here's another chance to see David killed by the Philistines. Saul was going to try and set him up so that he could try and get him killed. He's plotting and scheming for David's death. Now, maybe you're not wishing for full-blown murder like Saul, but don't we hope they mess up sometimes? Don't we hope they fail Don't we hope they lose because it makes us feel better about ourselves? Let me tell you this little quote. I I didn't come up with this, but I think it paints the picture well. Putting out another man's candle never makes yours shine any brighter. Okay? We know that's true, but in real life, it would serve us to remember that more often because that's what Saul did to David. If he dies, I'm better somehow. If I get rid of him, I'm a better person somehow. Why? Because he was trapped in comparison. I say this exact phrase to myself sometimes. Listen to this. Here's another chance to see them lose. This is a statement I say to myself every time. I hope I see them lose. Every time I sit down with my family to play a board game. Every time, every time, because I like to win, baby. I like to win, and I don't like to lose. I don't care how young they are. I don't care how beautiful she is. I'm trying to win. Anybody ever played Catan? It is the most serious game that I've ever heard of in my life. I love it. I love that game, and I'm a strategist, so I often win, baby. That's right. I do. How about Monopoly? You remember Monopoly? Grew up playing Monopoly? Come on. Well, that's, it's cool to play Monopoly. I, lo- I think I learned more math. I learned more math playing Monopoly, trying to figure out what they needed to roll off of two dice to land on my hotel so that they would lose. I learned more about math playing Monopoly than I did in math class. You know what I'm saying? Because I wanted to win. I love to win. I hate to lose, but just in board games, of course, of course, because I'm happy for Jesus and I'm a Christian, so I don't like anybody to... Does anybody feel me? Is I the only one up here all alone here? You're like, I don't know, man. It sounds like you've got a lot of problems. We'll pray for you. 
You know it's true. You know it's true. We want to see people fail sometimes, to lose, to mess up, just a little bit. Look, just a little bit. I just, if you just knock down a little bit, it'll make me feel a lot better about myself because we're comparing ourselves to them. That's how you know you're doing it. The minute you stop celebrating anyone's win, even on the inside, internally, any type of like satisfaction that comes from someone not doing well, you need to recognize that you are currently trapped in comparison. You're currently trapped in comparison, and it's time to get free. Yeah. It's time to get free. We're comparing ourselves to them. So when I'm compared to others, write this in your notes. When I'm compared to others, I am either blindly arrogant or I am miserably inferior. I'm either blindly arrogant or I am miserably inferior. Last week, we talked about who am I when I don't measure up, right? And that is the insecurity that comes from feeling miserably inferior. And where do we get that? By comparing ourselves to others, of course. But some of us have the opposite response. We get blindly arrogant. And this is what Saul did. He wanted to be the best, needed to be the best, even if he had to kill to be the best. It's just, it's absolutely terrible. And, and we don't kill people, but we assassinate their character, we will assassinate their character. We will discredit them in our minds. We will break them down a little bit because that's when we become blindly arrogant. It causes us to devalue others instead of celebrating them. What if we could just learn to celebrate people? What if Saul had learned to, man, young man, you have a bright future ahead of you. I'm so proud of you. Saul didn't do that, okay? He wasn't even close to doing that. But what if we, the people of God, changed our hearts and changed our minds and said, you know what? Even if it's the promotion I wanted, even if it's the family I wanted, even if it's the marriage I wanted, even if it's the Bible study I wanted, even if it's the thing I wanted, I'm, I'm happy for you. I am. I'm truly happy for you. What's the solution? We need to get to the solution here. How do we stop comparison from stealing our joy? This is not in your book. This is extra credit now. When you're in your group, this is, you're not going to find this in the book. This is a little off script right now. Um, you better become more like of a better person yourself than trying to compare yourself to others. Become better than yourself, not better than others. You thought I was going to tell you not to strive, didn't you? You thought I was going to tell you not to try. You thought I was going to tell you not to pursue great things and, do, and, and chase after your calling and be about what the Father wants to do in your life. Not at all. I'm saying you don't compare yourself to others to get there. You compare yourself to yourself to get there. How am I doing compared to where I should be in life? Compare yourself to yourself. Comparison is not a game you play against others. You will always lose if you do that. It's more like a game of golf. I am a golfer. I love golf. And you know what I love about golf? It's a game you play against yourself. It's a game you play against yourself. Like, you don't touch my ball, all right? In most other sports, it's like blocking and tackling, and I have to get around you, and it's me versus you. But when I'm playing golf and other sports like it, it's me versus me. It's how good am I doing compared to how good I should be doing. That's a beautiful picture of how we ought to be living our lives. It's me against me now. If Saul would have done that, it would have saved his life. It's me against me. Am I being a better king than I was yesterday? What I'm here to tell you is life is this way. Sp your spiritual growth is this way. You might be tempted to think people can affect you in your spiritual journey. They can't. They can't. It's very tempting to think they can. Oh, well, I'm not far along because then they, they're getting, no. It's you on you. And that's a, that's a comforting idea because no one can stand in your way. You don't need to compare yourself to anyone. It's you versus you. Listen, listen to this, 2 Peter chapter 1. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control, self-control with patience and patient endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection. These are all the things we're supposed to be doing as believers. And and godliness, brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love for everyone. And the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge. Notice all the yous in there. This is saying, this is going to make you a better follower of Christ. This is not going to make you better than the next guy. It's going to make you a better you. 
That's the key. When we're following Jesus, it's a, it's a one-on-one game, me on me. Am I doing better today than I was yesterday? This will make you a better, true fulfillment. True fulfillment is effective and fruitful in our knowledge of Jesus. That's what, that's what fulfillment is, is being effective and fruitful in our relationship with Jesus. So the only legitimate comparison is this, is you today versus you yesterday. All right, everybody, that's the only kind of comparison that on game day, I want to tell you what the real game is. Okay, everybody, I want to tell you the only real competition is am I doing better today as a follower of Jesus than I was yesterday? Are you growing, getting better, being more selfless, being more generous, being more studious, having better relationships? Is God holding you accountable to what you're supposed to be better than you were yesterday, not compared to what others do? Listen, comparison is the way of the world. Absolutely, 100%, the way of the world. Think about military. You wear on your chest, and all honor and respect to military, but you wear on your chest. Hey, I may not be as good as that guy, but I'm definitely better than that guy, and you wear it right here. It's the way of the world. In school, like, I'm, I'm graded. Well, I'm better than you, but I'm not as good as you. In the union, well, I've been here longer and I am got, got further, so I'm not as good as you. I'm better. Are, we are inundated with comparison. It's the way of the world. But Jesus said this, I am not of this world. And he calls us to not be of this world either. It's not about how I stack up against you. It's how I stack up against me of my past. Am I doing better? Am I growing? You know what the way of the kingdom is? Is the parable of the talents. The parable of the talents where Jesus told this story about a master who gave five talents, is big bags of gold, but it's really funny that it's called talents because it's really whatever God gives us. Think about it that way. He gives five to one, two to another, one to another. And to the two that he gives five and two, they work hard, double it. And you know what the master says to them? Well done, good and faithful servant. You have done well with what I gave you. You know what he didn't say? Well, you did better than that idiot over there. So you're doing all right, I guess. Just notice like the simplicity of this message. And when the one who was not faithful, who did not use the talents that he was given to grow and to move forward and to do all that, he hid it. He was he's faithless. The master said, you wicked and lazy servant. You know what he said? He said, I will punish you for what you did with what I gave you. You know what he didn't say? Well, you didn't have 10 like that guy. You didn't have four like that. He'd never compare. The master never compared one to the other. What I'm here to tell you today is it's not about what the person next to you is doing. It's not about how good they're doing. It's not how much they're giving. It's not how much they're working and growing in their spirituality. It's about what God has entrusted with you. Are you doing the things that God has asked you to do? Are you growing in your relationship with God? The comparison game ends today. It's you on you. It's you on you. God says to to these people who were faithful, and he says to you as well, I'm proud of what you do with what I give you. Become a better version of yourself, not a better version of someone else better version of you, not of someone else. 2 Corinthians 10 is our last verse of the day. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. Everyone say, without understanding. You don't understand how comparison destroys your life. You just don't. We don't until it's gone. You don't understand. When we compare, you don't understand how how damaging it is to our lives, how damaging it is to our relationship with Jesus. Don't compare yourself to others. I just want to tell you, I want to look you in the face and tell you, you don't need to. It's not about them. It's not about the person next to you. It's not about the person that's your age, but doing better than you. It's not the person who's been at the work the same amount as you, but somehow they're further along. It's not about them. They're on their own journey. They're on their own thing. It's you. You don't need to compare yourself to anyone. Not now, not ever. Compare yourself to the finished work of Jesus, that he gave his life for you. God sent his son that anyone who believes in him would have eternal life. 
God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world to each other. Say, well, you're doing pretty good. Well, you're not doing that good. Well, you're following the rules. Well, you're not following the rules. He came into the world to forgive and say, hey, I'm, I've equaled the playing field. We're all on the same playing field now. Now there's now no women, no men, no leaders, no followers, no Jews or Gentiles. Same playing field. You come to me, you'll be saved. You come to me, you'll be saved. That's what I want to offer you right now is become a better you. And the number one way, the only real way to do this is by giving your life to Jesus. Or maybe it's giving your life back to Jesus because I know how it can be sometimes. Maybe you used to be with him. You used to have a great relationship with him. You used to be tight, Bible plan, church, everything was great, but somewhere along the line you drifted. I want to tell you something. The, the parable of the lost son, that when the lost son came back, it wasn't like the father was sitting there in that story going, well, I was waiting for this day. I knew you'd come back. All right, kiss the ring. Jesus said he, he came running. The father came running. Whenever I talk about fathers, it always gets me, you know, because father is such this figure, you know, this strength. But whenever Jesus talks about the heavenly father, whenever we read about these stories of the father, and especially in those times, they were so distinguished that in this story, he hikes up his garb and he goes running to his son. We have a father that runs to us, you know? Our father runs to us. He loves us. He cares about you so much. He goes everything short of just grabbing you and taking you because he's a gentleman and he'll let you come if you want to. But it's like he's standing there right in front of our faces saying, just, I want you back so bad. I want you in my life so bad, God said. I sent my first son, my holy son. I gave him up so that you could come home. The rest of us sons and daughters can come home. The gospel is so powerful, I don't even fully understand it. But I want to offer it to you today. That anyone who would receive this salvation, anyone who would confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You will be saved. I want to invite you to make Jesus your Savior, but I also want to invite you to make Jesus your Lord, which means when he's my Savior, my eternity is settled, I'm going to heaven, not going to hell, going to heaven, that's my eternity. That's what making Jesus your Savior does. Making Jesus your Lord settles what your life here on earth is like and says, I know, I know, I know what, what my business is about. I'm about my father's business because Jesus is my Lord. He's my king. I just want to invite anybody who wants to do that today just to bow your heads with me. Just let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And this is a holy moment, sacred moment. So let's, if, if, if you're already a follower of Jesus, would you just pray alongside me to that hearts would be opened right now, that minds would be opened right now to receive this. Father, we love you. We love you so much. And we're so grateful for everything you're doing. We don't need, it's not about whether my, my family is saved. It's not about whether my coworkers are saved. It's not about what they're doing, anybody's doing. Today, here and now, Lord, we come before you ourselves, truly, purely ourselves. We don't identify because of our friends. We don't identify because of our coworkers or our family. It's just you and us in this moment. And Lord, we just want to come before you today. And if you want to take that step with me, with heads down, eyes closed, this is a very private, a very sacred. It'll get public f later, fine. But right now, this is between you and the Lord. To say, I want to give my life to Jesus. I believe that God sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for my sin, and I want to make him my Savior and my Lord. If that's you today, would you just lift your hand up and say, that's me. Go ahead, be bold. Do it right now. Amen. I see you and you. Hallelujah. I see you. Amen. I see you too. I see you. I see you. I see you too. Amen. You can put your hands down. We're going to pray right now. Just pray this prayer right after me if it's you. Say, Father God, I give you my heart. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on a cross for my sin. Fill me with your spirit. Make me new. Show me the path that I should walk. Amen.